Welcome to the Entrepreneur Show. This is your host, Michael Mara. I'm the CEO and founder of Entra, a social network for entrepreneurs, investors, and freelancers. On this show, we interview the top CEOs, venture capitalists, angel investors, and founders. Connect with me and thousands of other like-minded people by signing up for free at joinentra.com or download our mobile app on iOS and Android. On this episode, I am interviewing Brian Scudamore. He's the founder and CEO of O2E Brands, the banner company for 1-800-GOT-JUNK, WOW One Day Painting, and Shack Shine. Brian is a serial entrepreneur and has built a $500 million home service empire with each brand having a franchise location in every major metro area in North America and Australia. He's a respected industry leader and speaker. He has made appearances on Good Morning America, Dr. Phil, CNN, The Today Show, Oprah, CNBC, and he has an amazing story, and we dive into all the details with it, so I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Entrepreneur Show. I have a very special guest, Brian Scudamore of O2E Brands. You might be familiar with 1-800-GOT-JUNK, WOW, One Day Painting, or Shack Shine. He is a super founder, as I like to say. He's founded many companies, and I'm super excited to dive into this discussion and hear all about his entrepreneurial journey. Welcome, Brian. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Michael. Stoked to be here. And uh, my favorite topic, entrepreneurship. Yeah, uh, and and there's a lot going on right now. So I, I I love what you're doing, and you've done so many amazing things throughout your career. And um, for everyone who just heard the introduction, he's you know started several companies, and um, you know you you've you've done a lot. And I, I want to dial it back to the beginning. I know you you kind of uh, I guess stumbled upon the the junk business. Obviously, it's not super glamorous, but it's a problem that a lot of people have and, and you, you figured out a way to make that happen. I, I believe you started it when you were 18 and you just kind of came across this. So I'd love to hear that story, really the inception of like what made you become an entrepreneur and how all that started. Yeah, well, you talk about problems, right? Problems lead to opportunity. I mean, look at the world we're living in right now. Lots of hardship but entrepreneurship is born out of hardship. You find a problem and you go, hey, how can I make money at this? How can I do better? How can I make a difference in the world? So my story started in a McDonald's drive through of all places. I was one course short of graduation from high school and all my friends were going to university and college. And I thought, oh, I don't wanna miss out. Well, with not having graduated, I ended up approaching uh, the university and I, I said, listen, I'm smart enough. I can do this. I can get in. I talked my way in, but I had to fund my own education. My parents were not going to give me money for college since I showed them I couldn't finish high school. And back to the McDonald's drive through I'm there and I'm thinking, and there's this beat up old pickup truck in front of me with plywood sides. And it said, Mark's hauling on the side filled with junk. And I went, ah, there's my, there's my ticket that is going to pay my way through college. So I buy a pickup truck, 700 bucks, start a company a week later called The Rubbish Boys, and it paid for itself within two weeks. And there I was running the business while I was going to school, but I realized after a few years, I was learning more about business by running a business more than studying in school. So I sat my father down, who's a liver transplant surgeon, who's done more schooling than anyone I know, and I said, hey dad, I'm quitting school. So what are you talking about? I said, I am learning more about business and entrepreneurship by running a business. And I'm making a tough decision to leave because uh, I really want to grow my company. And off I went and the rest is history. Wow. And, and what was that conversation like? Because I, you know, when I left my, I used to be a civil engineer. When I left my job, my parents weren't necessarily against it. They were supportive, but they didn't really, you know, there wasn't too much pushback, but I know there's a lot of other entrepreneurs that their parents make them go to college. They make them get a job and all these other things. So um, what was that conversation like? Do you have any tips or on like going through that experience? Cause that conversation when you're younger and you have all these ideas and you want to be an entrepreneur might be tough for some people going through that. 
Yeah, Michael, a tough conversation for sure. I mean, who wants to let their parents down? I know that my parents really value school. My dad being a transplant surgeon, I mean, he's done so much college and education and I just, I knew he was gonna be heartbroken. But the way I framed it, he asked if I have any tips. I said, hey dad, I've got some good news. And he said, oh really? And I said, have a seat. So I brought it up in a positive way because legitimately for me, it was good news that I was dropping out of college. What an opportunity that I get to grow my business and really learn in the school of entrepreneurship on the streets versus right. studying in school. So while he didn't take it well, he ended up appro approaching a, a mentor of his, a, a friend who was actually one day a patient of his and a really successful entrepreneur. And he said, this is what my son's doing. And, and this entrepreneur said, you got a smart son. And he goes, what, You're, you think it's okay <laughs> for him to drop out of school? He said, hey, he sounds like he's got a good head on his shoulders and wants to learn, let him do it. He can always go back to school if he fails and uh, never went back to school. I, I love that. And yeah, I, I think there's, there's a really interesting thing going on right now, which is the entrepreneurship major is becoming extremely popular. Mm -hmm. And for me, it, it blows my mind um, that people are paying $100,000 plus and mm -hmm. spending four years to go to college to learn entrepreneurship. And most of the time, learn from professors who have never even started a business before either. And myself, uh, you know, I didn't study entrepreneurship in school, but the people who I know that are either in school right now studying or were in entrepreneurship majors or business majors, mm -hmm. they've learned and now are entrepreneurs, they've learned so much more outside and just doing it in the real world, just doing it by themselves right and learning from the like from the actual experience of starting it because a lot of the stuff that you're gonna struggle with or go through as an entrepreneur you they just don't have things for that in in college they don't have curriculum for it right uh so I, i'd love to get your thoughts on college right now right if, if people are either in college and they they have a business or they are like thinking they're in high school or whatever and they're having this discussion whether should i go to college and, and now a lot of the colleges are doing online stuff so mm -hmm. it's making it even a tougher decision i'd love to get your thoughts on on college and you know if people are interested in entrepreneurship what do you think they should do yeah i was in your city in new york i don't know a year and a half ago and i was meeting with gary vaynerchuk and you know, here's a guy who's done great, who's pretty anti-school. You know, I, I think I'm similar. I'm anti-school for entrepreneurship. If you want to be a doctor like my dad, hey, you can't just start cutting people open and practice and learn as you go, right? Uh, you know, you want to uh, get out there and learn the business of entrepreneurship out on the streets. You don't want a professor teaching you because the, the best teacher you can have as an entrepreneur is failure, mistakes. I wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago called WTF, which actually stands for willing to fail. And when I wrote the book, the title came after we wrote the book because I looked and I went, I made a mistake and I grew a mistake and I grew another mistake and I grew. And so all these failures as an entrepreneur, you've got to be willing to fail and make mistakes. Being in, in college, I don't think you're given the chance to, to make mistakes and fail. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And I, I like to look at it as experimenting, right? Not necessarily failing, because I think the word failing means it's like an end all be all, right? Sure. Like, uh, you're trying stuff out as an entrepreneur, even some of the biggest companies are constantly pivoting, trying new things, rebranding, launching new products, trying to figure out um, how to keep growing because business is dynamic, right? And if you're not adapting and, you know, trying to figure things out, you're probably not going to do well over the long run. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there's, there's so much there. And, and I, I love this book. Um, I'm, I, I think it's, 
I, I think you really like nailed it on, on the title and everything. And it, if you talk to a lot of successful people, they, they say the same thing about failing and failing fast and all of this stuff. Um, so how did you go then from, okay, you, you, you got the truck, you, you decide to quit college and you decide to start focusing on the business. How did you start then turning this into a massive company? Because you went from one truck to then several trucks scaling it up and then start franchising it. I think you had over 250 f franchisees of, of it. So how did you, how did you take those next steps to go from, okay, you have some money getting things rolling, but then how did you start turning into a real business? Yeah. And so to give you an idea, 31 years, right? These overnight success stories sure take a long time as they say, right? But it took me 10 years to get to the point where I could franchise. It took me eight years to get to a million in revenue, yet we will do a million in sales on any given day during our, our busy season. And so it takes time to scale up. It takes making a lot of mistakes. I think a key point for me was, uh, let's see, 1997. So about eight years into the business, I was at a million in revenue and I was at a bit of an inflection point. How do I grow beyond just a million? And not just how do I get to 2 million or 5 million, but how do I get to 100 million? And so I started to envision, what could this picture look like? And instead of thinking how I was going to get there, I started to think, what does there look like? And so I went to my parents' summer cottage, sat out on the dock, took out a piece of paper, and one page double-sided, I wrote what the vision, what the future would look like. And the way I wrote it was I said, we will be in the top 30 metros in North America by the end of 2003. That was looking five years out. I said, we'd be the FedEx of junk removal. I said, we'd have clean, shiny trucks, friendly uniform drivers. I said, we'd even be on the Oprah Winfrey show. And I came up with all these big, hairy, audacious goals that I wrote down this picture. And once I immediately started to share it with people around me, people got excited. Now I had some employees lead cause, leave because they said, you're smoking hope dope. This vision of top 30 metros isn't gonna happen. But I had a lot of people go, wow, I wanna be a part of this. Let's go build this. And people would ask me, how are you gonna get there? And I'd say to them, I, I don't know how, but that's why I'm recruiting a team of smart people so we can figure it out. So when you say, how did I create this big company? Hiring happy people, people smarter than me. As an entrepreneur, one of your jobs is find people or systems and processes that are way better than you could ever be and, and leverage that. You know, if I'm the, what's that quote? They say, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Right. I live that every day. I am surrounded by way smarter people. And I'm not just saying that I mean it. It's true. And I think that's the way you, you lead and grow. I, I love that. And I, I want to touch on something that you mentioned there um, about really you had, a, you wrote down like a, a dream list in a sense and a vision. And yeah. I think visualizing is extremely important. And I think thinking big is extremely important. It's something that I try to do almost every single day if I can. And my, like what, what we're trying to achieve at Entra and just me personally, like I, I want to do a lot of things. And when I tell people what we're doing, everyone's like, dude, you're, you're like, you're crazy ambitious and all of this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, like, these are things that, you know, we can really do. And you know, how exactly it's going to happen, you know, I, I'll, I'll let that, you know, ha like come to fruition when it does, because I'm not that smart to know exactly how it's going to work. And nobody is because most of the stuff, you know, comes from all different, you know, uh, people and random things that come into your life. So how important it like has you, I guess, really visualizing and thinking about it and believing that you can actually get there, um, then has like been actually like doing the work because no one can be a millionaire unless they believe they can be a millionaire, right? Sure. It's just, it's not really possible. So I'd, I'd love for you to share how important that has been to like to your success versus just like the hustle and the grind of what people think entrepreneurship is really all about. And obviously 
you have to put in the work, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on visualizing and, sure. and, you know, writing these things down and, and really focusing on the vision of it. When you talk about vision, you also talked about hustle. I think you have to have a clear vision first to inspire your hustle. If you're hustling, hustling towards what? You're, you're, you're walking aimlessly or you're, you're going towards a goal that isn't clear. If you have a vision and it's clear in your mind as the entrepreneur, great, get out there and chase it. It's like when I had my painted picture, I knew what the future looked like so clearly. It was in my head that decision-making started to happen that would always bring me closer to that vision. So I said we'd be in the top 30 metros by the end of 2003. We hit that goal 16 days early. About 90 days out from that goal, we were at 28 of 30 metros. And someone in my franchise development department said, Brian, like we're missing Mits, uh, Pittsburgh and Milwaukee. What are we going to do? We got to get to the top 30. We created a plan. We went out to the press, all sorts of things. We made it happen. And it wasn't just me holding people accountable to the vision. It was people in my company that had read the pic painted picture and said, we want to do this. We're setting out to win. Uh, by the way, if any of your listeners, viewers uh, want to know more about Painted Picture, I'm, I'm passionate about it. I wrote an article about it. I'll, I'm happy to share our Painted Picture for our company. So on any of the social mediums, LinkedIn, Instagram, they can just at Brian Scudamore and send me a message. But vision to me is everything. You know, you, you I'm sure being a young guy who's uh, got all these dreams, you study successful people, successful people have a clear vision of what the future looks like for them. It's not how to get there. You hustle because you know where there is and you believe in it. Uh, last thing I'll say on it, uh, uh, you know, is Walt Disney. We got a big quote up in the office. Walt Disney had said, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. I mean, you think these impossible things, you dream up these businesses of Airbnb and Amazon and whatever it might be, DoorDash, things that, all three of those entrepreneurs were told they were stupid ideas. They were impossible, but no, they got out there and they made them happen. They believed. Yeah. I, I love that. And I think your, what you mentioned about having the vision first that inspires the hustle is so critical because I like to think of it too, as there's so many people who, grind, hustle, work so hard, but the vision's not aligned. So they're, they're almost working really hard and going in the wrong direction. Totally. Uh, the direction you need first, once you know where you're going, then you can work hard and hustle and grind to get there. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you know, having that vision and something that you're passionate about is going to get you through the ups and downs as well. Uh, so I really love that. Yeah. And it's interesting because people will say, well, how do I create a vision of what I want? Find someone you know and trust to ask you questions. So get somebody to sit there and say, what does it look like? How many employees do you have? What city are you in? Describe your office. And, and you're just, you're leaning into the future and you're describing that future state of what your business looks, feels, and act, acts like. Um, it's not a hard thing to do, but you need someone to pull it out. You need a coach. You need a friend just to ask you a ton of questions. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a great uh, way of looking at it and surrounding yourself with the right people. One of the reasons why we've built Entras, you know, giving people an outlet um, in a community as an entrepreneur to ask questions and just surround yourself with like-minded people and mentors. Um, so it, it, it's fantastic. And I, I, I am loving, loving all of this. Um, you, you mentioned, you brought up coaches and, and mentors. Do you have any mentors and coaches um, that have helped you along the way? And could you describe maybe some of the really key things and learnings uh, from, from those mentors or coaches? Mm -hmm. So I, I've been fortunate to have lots of mentors, but I've also been, I've created my own luck by reaching out to them and, and I'll pick up the phone, you know. So one of my mentors, uh, Fred DeLuca, he's since passed on. He was the founder of Subway. 
billions and billions of dollars in sandwiches. I mean, you create an amazing franchise business. And because I, with O2E Brands, with 1-800-GOT-JUNK, Wow One Day, Shack Shine, they're all in the franchise space, I wanted to learn from one of the, the godfathers of franchising. And so I was at a conference and saw him. I went up and chatted and he, I said, I'd love to pick your brain sometime. He gives me a cell phone number. He goes, yeah, call me up. He goes, I'll talk to you in between drives, between meetings. And over the years, we had a ton of phone calls where he would just be driving. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to a meeting right now. Can you call me back in about two hours? Great, great. And we just got, I got to pick his brains. And so I think that learning from people who have been there and done it, that's the entrepreneurial shortcut. Why make the same mistakes that others have made and fixed? Why not learn from others and just pick up the phone and ask questions? So one of the most powerful pieces of advice I ever got from a mentor, his name was Greg Brophy. He was the founder of Shreddit, a multi-billion dollar shredding company. And I remember he said to me once, he said, Brian, because I, I, I had said, what's the most powerful thing you've learned? And he said, never, ever, ever compromise on the quality of people you bring into your organization. And I think as entrepreneurs, we go, I like that guy or gal, let's bring him in. But do we spend enough time getting to know them and say, is this the right fit? Do they have the values that we're looking for here? Are they really the right person? And am I compromising because I can't find someone else? If I'm compromising, wait till you find the right person. And uh, that advice has never let me down. If I think of franchise partners, the reason why I think we've been able to build a half a billion dollar Canadian dollars uh, brand of companies is how hard we work at selecting the right franchise owners. We're not looking for people to come in who've been entrepreneurs necessarily, but we find entrepreneurially minded people who can't find an idea of what they want to start. And then they go, oh, tax shine, house detailing, that's pretty cool. And they get fired up with us and they go, your, your uh, idea, my hard work, my investment of time and energy, learning from other franchise partners of ours as we grow, it's been a, a super successful formula and that's been their mentorship. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. And I, I think there's a lot of great things that uh, the franchise industry can do, uh, especially coming up here. Uh, I think in the next 10 to 20 years, because, you know, we believe strongly that entrepreneurship is going to become more and more popular. I think more people are going to want to just be their own boss and kind of set their own schedule and, and you know, do all of that. Uh, but a lot of people struggle to come up with the idea, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think having an outlet um, and a way to do that, that where the model's already completed, and all you need to do is really put in the work to do it and, you know, have an interest in that space, I think could be extremely beneficial. So how many people, and I, I want to talk about the hiring a little bit too, but real quick, I want to hear how many people have you actually helped, uh, like, start their own company? And, and how many of these entrepreneurs have you created and how many, you know, how much money are they making with, with all your brands and, and businesses? Well, hundreds of millionaires, but I haven't created them. They've created themselves, right? They joined our cause and they said, oh, Brian's got this great idea. Wow, one day painting where we go paint someone's home in a day. And what a revolutionized, uh, revolutionary business idea. They've joined us and together we've built something bigger and better together versus what any one of us would have chosen to build alone. We create these stronger systems and find better ways, better business practices as we build and every one of our franchise partners benefits from that. Uh, it's interesting that just reflecting on, you know, you saying people struggle finding an idea, but that's where I think sometimes a good idea is potentially franchising. Uh, it, what I would do now if I was, you know, in my, you know, late teens, early twenties, uh, again, and, and trying to talk my way into school, instead of putting money towards an entrepreneurial education, um, I'd go learn from someone else. I'd go work for an entrepreneur. I'd talk my parents into, instead of putting, you know, a hundred grand into an education, put it into a franchise. I'd find a creative way to learn in the entrepreneurial world. And because uh, that's where, when people are interested in business, 
it, you know, my, my daughter is starting to think about business as she gets closer to going to college. She love just it. Like, sounds like it provides you everything. And so clearly you and I are both passionate about entrepreneurship, and business, <laughs> but ton of fun and uh, a great education. Sure. Yeah. And the reason that I got addicted to it is because it unlocks the ultimate freedom. Totally. You are in complete control, right? You, there's no limit to anything that you can do. You have unlimited ability to be creative, to make as much money, to work as much, to work as little, to go to work wherever you want. That's the stuff that gets me going, right? Because I'm all about freedom. How can I create different avenues where I can control where I go, who I, who I work with, how, when I work, how much, all of that stuff. And, you know, it, it gives you the ability to work on the things that you really want to work on. Uh, so I, I think it's um, really important. And uh, I, I love that your, your daughters get into it and um, some of these people. And it, it's, it's really, it has to be fulfilling knowing that you've helped so many people go through this. And um, I, I, I think it's really something that uh, I tell people all the time, if I were to go back and do it again, because I didn't actually work at another startup or another business. Um, and I 100% would have done that if knowing what I know now, I would have looked at all the startups who have raised a significant amount of funding. Um, and I would have looked at what industries I liked, um, and what founders I liked, and I would have hit up all their whole team and everyone I would have tried to get a job at one of these top startups that are growing fast. And I would have sat there and I would have learned from the founder and their team on how they grow over, mm-hmm. you know, because some of these companies, they're, they're trying to grow fast. And if you're involved in that, you're going to understand the strategies and all the stuff involved, how to talk to investors, the, the different mm-hmm. ways that tech companies and high growth companies work very similarly with franchises. You know, once you get in and start learning, you will understand how the machine works. So uh, I think it's really, really fascinating. I'd love to talk, um, switch gears now to the, the hiring, which mm-hmm. is, you know, and you mentioned this is really critical. Would you say that it's more important to find someone with a, a skill set or find someone who's more of a culture fit? Mm-hmm. Um, and then feel free to add in any other suggestions on, you know, how to go about this because you're like, you mentioned you're picking people for a franchise. Um, a lot of people struggle with finding co-founders or early employees. So do you have any advice on that? Yeah, whether we're looking for people uh, as entrepreneurs, as franchise owners, or whether we're looking for people in the head office, we've got about 500 head office staff between our call center and our IT team and so on. Um, we look for the same thing. We hire happy people. We want people that are optimistic, that see the world as full of possibility and opportunity and that they want to build something bigger and better together. And so the, the technique we use to find great people, we call, and, and to your point too, sorry, on, uh, we hire on attitude, train on skill. We don't need someone that's ever got any entrepreneurial experience. They might have been laid off from corporate America and now they're ready to be an entrepreneur. Great, our systems are strong, we'll train you. Uh, this is a business education that you get on the job. Um, but the, the technique we use, it's called the beer and barbecue test. And uh, it's simple. If I'm interviewing somebody or anyone in the company is, we say, would you have a beer with that person? Do you like them? Are they interesting? Are they interested? Are they somebody that you have some shared values, some shared passion with? Like there's there's a spark there and you go, yeah, I want to work with this person. Then great. That passes sort of the cultural test. The barbecue side is how do they fit within the entire company? If we were to throw a company picnic, a company barbecue, our people are not all the same. Lots of diversity, lots of introverts and extroverts, but we wanna know that somehow it fits. You know when you're at a party and there's a great vibe and you're just like, this is a great party and it just works? It's like that in our company. The, the, The diversity of people and opinions and how they work, it all works well together. And so we say, would they fit at a, at a company barbecue? So the beer and barbecue test is, is a simple one, but I find it's better than doing the whole formal four hours of questions back and forth. They're all hypothetical. 
it, it's much more practical. And you, as an entrepreneur, you got to trust your gut. Yeah, one hundred percent. I I love that beer and barbecue. That that's great. And I like your point too about the attitude, and then you know training the skills because I I think it's for us everyone that I want to work with or hire here is. I look how fast can they learn because mm-hmm. when I look at technology and all the stuff that's happening, even just in the last couple of years, as I've started the company, I've seen things change so fast, especially with COVID things have moved really, really quickly. Yeah. And what who, the people who I want to be surrounded by are people who can learn fast and who are, you know, able to pick up on things and not be afraid to try something new and adapt. So do you look at that at all? Do you, do you look for people who can pick up on new trends quickly um, within, within the business at all? Yeah, it depends on the role. You know, if we're looking for a strategy person, uh, we definitely want them to have that strategic mind of looking for new opportunities. But really the, the thing we're looking for is do people want to build something with us whether they're an entrepreneur and they're within the business at the head office or as an entrepreneur, as a franchise owner. Um, and we want to know that they depend on themselves. They, they depend on working together as a team and learning from one another. But at the end of the day, they're going to get the job done, whatever it is, because they're passionate. They want to, you know, you talked about hustle and, and, and having the freedom as an entrepreneur. To me, entrepreneurs often work incredibly hard, even though they've got this freedom to not work all the time, they've got the freedom to do the type of work that they want. And they're so passionate about it that they work so much. And, uh, you know, I've got great balance in my life. I take Fridays off. I take five weeks vacation in the summer where I'm off with the kids. Uh, but when I'm working, I'm working hard and, uh, and it doesn't feel like work. I love what I do every day of it. Yeah. I, I, I I love that. And it is hard to balance things out, right? Um, as an entrepreneur, when you're going so fast and, and trying to do so many things. But yeah, I mean, a lot of times I don't, I don't think of work as work, right? I, I'm just doing what I'm doing. And I'm obsessed with solving this problem and doing it. So uh, I think it's really, uh, I think it's really interesting, uh, for sure. And I want to talk about to funding because uh, you built your business really uh, just growing it really naturally. You haven't raised any uh, like funding from venture capitalists or anything like that, correct? Didn't, didn't raise a dollar. Right. You know, we've a half a billion dollar business, but we, but part of that is we did it so slowly. Million dollars in revenue, it took us eight years to get there. But I was able to fine tune the systems. I was then able to shift to a franchise model, which meant people would pay us a franchise fee to join our business and we could use that cash to build up more infrastructure and slowly but surely we built this awesome business. Yeah. And it, it's, it's really amazing too, because nowadays it, you know, raising capital is almost put on a pedestal. It's like, if you can raise this million, that means you're successful. And it, and it's really strange for me because uh, you know, I'm from Pittsburgh and, you know, not like the Bay area or anything. And when I see all these companies, it's like they, they're, you know, it's almost like they uh, are, they're putting how much money they raised off of being successful versus how much they're actually making and really doing as a business. Uh, So it's really fascinating. Um, Would you have, so knowing what you know now, would you have taken on any capital? Would you maybe brought on some strategic investors to help or would you have, you know, done it bootstrapped and use the customer cash and, you know, fees from franchisees to grow the business the way that you did? That's an awesome question. I don't think I would have done anything differently because I think had I taken on money from investors, as I've seen with a lot of my friends who are entrepreneurs, they blew it or they blew a big wad of it, right? Where they were trying to spend themselves into faster growth, but they needed to figure out how to, how to lead people, how to build systems, how to figure out their business model. And there's some things that I think you just, you can't speed up as quickly by just buying your way through it. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, yeah, you know, I, I really wouldn't have changed a thing. So 
I'm not your guy to give any advice on raising money. <laughs> I'm your yeah. guy to say. I, I wasn't, I, I was curious because I, I'm so impressed by it. And I know it's even harder to do now more than ever to, to do this without funding. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think a lot of companies, they try sprinting before they even start walking in, in a sense, you know, they try to go from crawling to, you know, running at, you know, uh, before they, they really figure things out. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be very mindful of that with what we're doing, even though we've brought on some angel investors and we're going to be raising some more capital here. I don't want to do things just like the standard, you know, Silicon Valley way. I do want to do things a little bit more strategic, try to actually generate some, you know, real revenue and, you know, get very close to profitability um, early on and stay, you know, balanced um, rather than just going too extreme. So uh, I think that's uh, really interesting. Do you have any uh, tips for people who, maybe don't want to raise venture capital? Um, you know, it, was there, were there any things that you did that um, helped you really scale and grow just through, through your own, you know, business itself, right? The, the old natural way. Um, yeah. there, do you have any, anything um, that you might want to share to help people who maybe want to stay bootstrapped and just keep, you know, growing slowly rather than giving up equity and, and raising capital? Yeah. You know, uh, what we did, and it was quite simple, is we just found the, the cheapest way to get things done. And so getting PR as an example, getting out there and getting free press. You know, we went out to Oprah and Wall Street Journal and CNN. We'd pick up the phone. I mean, it cost nothing to call and pitch a story. It took a lot of hard work because, you know, Oprah took us 14 months of pitching and pitching before we landed that big media hit. Um, but but using things, using your creative mind to say, how can I solve a problem? Instead of spending a ton of money on advertising, how do we spend money on free press, which is very little money? You know, I, I even, I remember Starbucks. I'm a big fan of coffee and especially the Starbucks brand. And I find that what Starbucks did, I read an article about them years ago, that they didn't spend a nickel on advertising until they hit over 10 million in revenue. So they then, once they created some size and scale, they said, okay, let's get out there now and spend money on advertising. We spend, I think we're $8 million a year now in radio ads for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. We didn't do any uh, of mass media in the, the first 20 years because we couldn't afford it. It would have been a waste of money if we can't do it right. Interesting. That, that's really interesting too with the radio ads as well. Um, because, you know, now all, all the crazes, you know, Facebook ads and, you know, YouTube ads and all of this stuff, um, how, why radio ads and have you tested other channels and the radio ads have worked the best? Yeah, we've definitely done all sorts of other channels, but radio is such a great mass medium and it's one of the only mass medias where mediums where people are focused. If you're watching a Netflix show on, on TV, you're still kind of checking your texts from your friends, you know? Like when people are watching what used to be broadcast TV and, and TV ads, it's different now, right? You're just, you're, you don't have yeah. that captive audience where people would watch the show Friends all at the same time on Thursday night and then watch the ads in between. And so when we're on our computer doing something and you're getting hit with ads, you're distracted, you go down rabbit holes with a radio, you know, you're generally driving or maybe you're listening to radio while you're doing a little bit of work in the background, but radio is still, still out there. It's, you know, I get that people are listening to podcasts and other uh, things, but no, it, it works great for us. And That's it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Cause I I've actually heard uh, it, you know, depending on the business, it can work extremely well. Um, and, and some of these uh, big shows uh, have the highest conversions of any uh, platform out there. So uh, it, it's, it's really fascinating. And I, I want to, um, I, I want to talk about uh, the, you got quoted on 10 million uh, Starbucks cups. Uh, I want to talk about that. And then how did you get on Oprah? We got to, we got to, we got to figure, we got to hear the pitch. Uh, Cause I, I want to learn about how, how you did that. Yeah. 
well, they're both tied together in, in, in some way, the Oprah media hit and uh, the Starbucks cups. So we have this wall at our office called the Can You Imagine wall. And it says, can you imagine with a bunch of different big ideas that people in the company have of things they want to get done, a contribution of theirs to the business. So I put the first Can You Imagine up, which was Can You Imagine being featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show? And people used to look at that and I had my name below it. And people are like, what are you talking about? How are we as a little junk removal company gonna get on Oprah? And our first PR hire made it his mission and he was calling Harpo Studios where Oprah's company and just pitch after pitch after pitch an idea till one day um, there was a, a guest that wrote in that said, my mom's a hoarder. I need someone to help clean it up. I think, you know, I can't believe people live like this. And it turned into an episode on, uh, on Oprah. And so we went and cleaned out this hoarder's place in LA. I got invited to Chicago to be on the show. I'm sitting there across from Oprah, four and a half minutes of fame. And I'm like, well, this is unbelievable. And, uh, and we did it. So we That's were able awesome. to off that wall. And, uh, you know, so one of the ones was, uh, can you imagine that a, someone in the company, Andrea uh, Baxter contributed, well, she said, you used to get these Starbucks cups that have like little quotes from famous people and from authors and movie stars. and uh, she said, I can see us having a quote on there from you. And I kind of didn't really see it. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. And she gave me a picture in her mind as to, to why that could happen. And I said, okay, I can see it. I made an introduction to someone I knew that knew someone at Starbucks. And sure enough, they made it happen. And on the side of 10 million, you know, $5 lattes, it said, you are what you can't let go of by Brian Scudamore. And uh, I didn't care my name was on there, but I cared that it said the founder and CEO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Our company was on the side of 10 million Starbucks cups for free. Again, guerrilla marketing. You can't buy that kind of advertising. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was awesome just to accomplish something that we had imagined, but even better knowing the, uh, what, what impact that had on their business. Uh, I, I love that. that. That's great. And I think it's so smart how, how you how you did some of these campaigns. Uh, can you talk about the significance of the quote and what, what it means, if you, if you wanna dive into that too? Yeah, so remember, I'm a high school dropout, I'm a college dropout, so I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Starbucks helped me write it. Uh, and the quote, you are what you can't let go of, is basically, you know, in junk removal, you think we collect things, but why can't we at times just let go of them? Why do we hold on so tight? And so, uh, you know, Oprah actually said, um, anything in your home should be, should be one of two things, something that's useful or something you love and get rid of everything else. And so in the junk removal business, I'm certainly a minimalist. Uh, my wife's a minimalist and uh, we love when customers uh, don't want to accumulate junk and want to get rid of it. Yeah, I, I think it's actually going to be a huge problem because uh, people have been buying so much stuff uh, now that e-commerce is just blowing up. Yeah. Um, I actually think there's going to be an interesting thing that's going to happen in the next, I don't think it's going to happen really soon, but possibly in the next like five to 10 years, which is where the reseller market is just going to be massive because mm -hmm. people are going to have a lot of really quality stuff. And people aren't going to need to buy new things. They'll buy refurbished and stuff, or let's say the majority of people, like yeah. everyone's going to, some people are always going to want the new stuff, the new thing. Right. But um, I think there's going to be a huge market in the reseller game where people can get a lot of really quality things. Um, so it's so fascinating, but I'd love to, I know, I know we're coming up on time here. So I, I want to ask uh, one final thing and then we can get in where can people find you and, and learn more about your brands, sure. if they want to franchise, you know, one of your, one of your companies and, and get started with, with something or just learn more about you and stay up to date with everything that you're doing. Cause I know you're also a contributor on, on a, a few different magazines and you do a lot of great content out there um, as well. But I want to talk about this um, entrepreneurship uh, mm -hmm. term that uh, I guess you created in, in a sense too. So uh, let's talk about that uh, here before we wrap up. Yeah, I was looking at the word entrepreneur one day and I just 
I was like, somehow I just changed the letter and I changed, I put a Y in there, entrepreneur. And what I was thinking is so many people get stuck with not being able to come up with an idea. Well, maybe the idea is something different. Maybe the idea is the business model, not the actual business. And so it got me thinking about franchising as the ultimate entrepreneur model, the entry point for someone who goes, and, and I'm not talking age, like it has to be someone junior, but, it, but it's somebody who goes, I've never run a business. I've always wanted to learn how. Investing in a franchise, you're given that springboard, that platform. Here's the training, the systems, the support. You're learning from others in the business. You know, all of our franchise partners learn from each other. They'll pick up the phone and someone in Pittsburgh will call someone in the Bay Area and say, how are you having success with radio? What are you doing? How are you hiring your guys? And so it's the ultimate open source learning model. And uh, so entrepreneurship, it's, it's our truck team members and call center agents who one day end up becoming a franchise owner. What's the entry point into the world of entrepreneurship? Um, and it's a successful, successful one. So proud of that. Amazing. Yeah, I, I think it's awesome. Uh, and I think there's actually a lot of things that we can probably collaborate on with our network and a lot of the entrepreneurs within our network or people who are looking to become entrepreneurs. Um, I'd love to start figuring out ways to get them into some of your brands and becoming uh, franchisees. How can people sign up? What are the steps? How does the process look like to to do this, right? If they wanted to start a, a 1-800 junk franchise or uh the the wow one day painting franchise or or the shack shine franchise how did what's the process like how long does it take and how how would they get started if they really wanted to yeah so if they went to even you know you could go to 1-800-got-junk.com and there's a button that says start a franchise you could go to o2e brands letter o number two letter e brands.com and you can see all our franchises um many sort of entry points into the world of learning more about us. We've got lots of content on there. But what we do is if someone sees that it could be a fit for them, we set them up with a phone call and we start an interview to, to find out if the fit is right. Uh, one in a hundred people that apply for one of our franchises become successful. And so that tells you we're, we're selective, but we've learned that we can't put someone who's got the money in but doesn't have the right attitude and cultural fit into the business and they then fail we get a black mark on our record we have to feel bad i mean it's we want to find the right people who are the right fit for for our model and our company that's awesome and i have to ask too what does o2e stand for that's ordinary to exceptional so my mission in the world is to take ordinary people like myself and help them be exceptional entrepreneurs uh, or to take ordinary businesses like junk removal, house painting and window washing and make them exceptional businesses through incredible people and awesome customer service. Absolutely love it. Well, Brian, thank you so much. This was awesome. Uh, if like. there's any other places where people can find you or anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap up here. Yeah, all the social medias, you know, we, we're on them, whether it's Instagram, at Brian Scudamore, or LinkedIn, Facebook, you name it. Uh, and if I can ever help anyone, if, you know, uh, don't be a stranger, reach out, send me a note, uh, tell me what you think of the book, whatever it is, just uh, stay connected. I love talking with entrepreneurs. Fantastic. Well, I really enjoyed this. I, I would love to stay in touch. And thank you so much for taking the time. And I know this is going to help a lot of people and uh, I'm excited to see what, what you're up to like over these next years. Cause I think, uh, I think you, you guys are going to do extremely well um, into the future. And I'm excited to like hear more about your future successes as well. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. This was great. You got it.